So our final uh, talk before lunch is, uh, is from Marco Pinheiro from EDP. Uh, Marco is going to give us some insights into the data innovation projects that EDP are running. So please give a round of applause <coughs> to Marco. Hi, thank you. So today I will uh, walk you through of some projects that we uh, have done in EDP. So my mission is not only, only talk about the, how important it is to the business, but mostly talk about uh, what's going on behind the scenes. My name is Marco Pinheiro. I work in EDP uh, for the last uh, nine years, I guess. Uh, EDP has almost 12,000 employees spread over the 16, 16 countries. And this number over there, we in the, the IT corporate manage almost uh, 340 um, applications. And, only, and this number is only for Portugal and Spain. Maybe you, you know already EDP. What you maybe not, doesn't know is EDP Innovation. EDP Innovation is um, a company inside of the, of the group EDP and is responsible for testing new technologies to understand the buzzwords that re reach us and make uh, or build a project, cutting edge for projects. So the EDP Innovation is uh, organized in uh, three teams, the tech, the tech groups, the EDP Ventures, and the EDP uh, Starter. So EDP Ventures and the Starter supports new startups that can help uh, EDP in the business of EDP and the tech groups and I work in the data leap. Data leap is where data and machine learning meet to, to build up uh, great projects. So I will go through this agenda. So three, three subjects. The first one is about how we um, understand how our loop uh, uh, the plantation of the, of the Hadoop ecosystems and how we uh, develop new projects inside of this tech. The second subject is electricity, electricity forecasting, how we can forecast almost uh, uh, 100,000 sites, and then the vegetation mo monitoring, how we monitor thousands of trees that grow nearby the power lines. So the first one, is a, a, a little story about big data at EDP. I scratch big because the new standard is, is big, okay? The data is big for, is a new standard. And we start in uh, 2013 with a small experience in the AWS, in the cloud. In that time, Amazon already have, has uh, Hadoop in, in our catalog, in our ecosystem. And then we build up um, what we call the low cost cluster. So in this low cost cluster, we uh, get or we got uh, 46 laptops, old laptops from the, after four years of use. And instead of go to garbage or uh, deliver to institutions, social institutions. We got them, and uh, plus one rack, more two switches, make the cable, the cabling, the power, and the network, and then we install operating systems and the Hadoop ecosystem. And this was the first cluster that we built up in our company, inside of our company, and today is using for R and D uh, investigation. In that same year, we understand this, this Hadoop ecosystem is very important and has a good potential for the business. So, of course, we understand that in that time that it's important to get uh, an uh, enterprise-ready ecosystems. And we push in 2016 to, to the IT corporate, so we are EDP Innovation and we we try to push the new technologies to, to the IT corporates if, if, the, if, the, if the product or, or the technology is, 
is good for, for the business. So in, in, in this time, uh, IT corporate used ecosystem, Hadoop ecosystems in several projects in the, in the company. So this is a little story about what we do at EDP Innovation. We start with testing new technologies and tries to push into, in this case, into the, the IT corporate. I would like to talk also about this subject, the electricity, electricity forecasting. So what we have is, um, we have this grid, okay? And we have several sites in the, in the grid that we measure each 15 minutes the power that flows or, uh, over there. And so we get the time series. In, indeed, we get the active electricity and reactive electricity. So we have uh, 100,000 sites, but we get uh, 200,000 time series. And our goal is to okay, forecast these time series every day, updated every day for the next few weeks. So how we do this? So this is more or less a, a, a normal time series. So you can see uh, seven peaks and set seven valleys that respond to a week so for the seven days of the week. You can see the last two days is, is for the, the weekend. So they, there is a negative um, effect on the, on the consumption. And also you can see the, the difference between the, the winter and the summer. So there are some, even though they are similar, the peaks interdaily are uh, slightly different. So the public holidays are, is also important. So in, in this case, we get this Christmas, Christmas time. And you can see that, that the consumption is lower than the other days. But it's also important how the other days around the Christmas. So in this case, the Christmas Eve, um, the 24th. Indeed, this is Sunday, um, Saturday, Sunday, and this is the Monday. And, the, and as you can understand, uh, between the weekend and the Christmas, many industries is closed, many offices is closed, and the consumption is, uh, is lower. And of course, it's very important for all the, to the algorithm to try to model this information. In this case, this, the output of this, uh, of this graph, the, the, the algorithm doesn't have it, uh, that into account. And so, even though the, the public OLI, they get a, a, a good pre prediction, in the, the day, um, in the Monday, is not so good. The temperature is also very important, and there is a, a, a high effect on the consumption. So in this case, are two years of consumptions, um, 2012 and 2013, and the color is uh, the temperature. So you can see the summer, in the middle of the year with the higher blue, and in the winter with darker blue. And you can see some peaks. In, the, in this case, we saw that this was the low temperature, low temperature demand uh, corresponds to demand, a demand peak. In this case, it was a, a European cold wave uh, that came from the uh, Siberian high. And the other case, like this, the high temperature also uh, uh, as an effect on the, the consumption, and, and the consumption is higher. And this case was the first, first highest with heat wave in the since the direct resists. So the temperature is very important. If you scatter plot, if you uh, put the, the, the points with the temperature in the X and the power demand in the Y, you get some graphs like this. So we can see some, every time you do this, you see that this part, pattern. You can see a middle over there, bit more or less the, the 18, 18 uh, degrees. And there is a positive effect on demand if, if the temperature is higher or if the temperature is lower. And also you can see uh, this angle and this angle corresponds to the sensitivity of that site for the temperature. And you can see that industrial 
maybe have another angle. Officers maybe are more sensitive, have a more sensitive to the to the temperature, and so the angle is closer. So it can be a, a good um, a good information to split different time series and uh, corresponding to different types of of consumptions. You can also graph, or you can also uh, not also, not only use the temperature, but also the the hour of the day. So we, we here we have the temperature, in this case, and here we have the hour, okay? And then the effect of the temperature of the, of the, on, the, on the consumption. So you can see the, the angle, too, in this graph. You can see that during the night, low and medium temperatures, low temperatures over the daylight, the medium temperatures over the daylight, and the, also the high temperatures over the all day. Okay. So in this case, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a very important information to, to, um, to, to get to the, into the model. So the idea is to use uh, generalizative models with very uh, components, with, uh, with uh, many components. We have here the, the auto reg uh, regressive uh, variables. So we get there the, the load one week, uh, sorry, one day and two days before. So it's auto re uh, related variables. Then here we have this temperature and the time of the day. That is the graph that we show um, uh, previously. Also the temperature one day. Uh, before, because there is some inertia, term, thermal inertia. The day of the week is also important, the, if it is a public holiday or not, in the, the um, here season, seasonality, and some, and some things about the time of the day. Corresponding to different types of days, we are using different, different functions. So the idea of uh, generalizative models is, is build up this, uh, this uh, structure, and we believe this structure is good enough to, to get the information from the training data sets. And then the, the generalizative models tries to fit all the functions. So this function is, is calculated by the algorithms, and the parameters is also calculated by the, by the, by the generalizative models. So this is, all, with other things around this, this is the, uh, how we forecast the, the, uh, the energy. And because we have so many time series, we have to, ha to deploy these to a distributed cluster. So we use HBase from the ecosystems Hadoop to store energy time series, the weather forecastings, the, the models itself, the models calibrated, and the, the energy forecastings, the output of the model. So we have, we have, the, uh, we use the GAM, the uh, generalizative models, and the, and this model is fitted against all time series separately, okay, and get the information from those from those time series, and we store that model calibrated in the HBase, and also Yarn, that is a, a resource manager in the Hadoop ecosystems, that. Uh, delivers resources where we can build up containers and run some stuff there. So we run what we run there is the the forecasting or the calibration phase of the model. So in this case, we we can process every day uh, the two hundred thousands of time series. Another subject is about vegetation monitoring. Uh, and the goal, as, as you can know, there is many kilometers, kilometers of, uh, uh, of power lines, almost in Portugal, um, uh, 76,000 of kilometers. And there is trees that grow nearby the power lines and the DSO, the distributed system operator, needs to, to guarantee that the, the, the trees doesn't grow inside of the, 
of all we, what we call corridors that are clean of vegetation. So there is several steps in this uh, process. So we capture or collect the data using LiDAR technology. Then we, to, to calculate the distance between the vegetation and the power lines, we need to identify from the cloud points and we'll see what belongs to a power line and what belongs to the ground and what belongs to the, to the vegetation. And then the prediction. So we have to predict how, how the vegetation grows until the next capture that, that, makes, that occurs after three years to five years. So the first thing is the capture. So we have a LiDAR sensor installed in the helicopter and the helicopter flies over the power lines. And this LiDAR sends a pulse, a directional pulse, and we receive feedback. Okay. And that feedback is, the, is what we, is the raw data that we uh, get. So this is example of what we get. So you can see or identify some power lines over there, some noise, or the birds, I don't know. Um, trees, vegetation, the ground, but in the first step we don't have that, that information. And the, the output is very, is very dense. For, for in this case, we have uh, 17 million points, and it's only uh, less than three kilometers of, uh, three kilometers of um, power lines. So the, the output is very dense. And what we capture is more that localization of that points. There is also the intensity of the, of, the, of, the, of the feedback and also the return number and number of returns. And that information is important to, to try to classify uh, what, what, what is the point, what are the points. So the, the goal is to build up um, a model that tries to classify what, what are the points. If this point belongs to a power line, or if this point belongs to a, a, a pole, a vegetation, it belongs to the ground, or if it is merely noise. Because of, after that step, we can calculate the distance between the vegetation in all, in, over all the power lines. We can calculate the distance between the power lines and the vegetation, and that is the, the, the information that we need to extract. So more than the localization, we have another features like the light, like the like, like intensity, and in this case, yeah, the light intensity is something. Um, the the lidar sends a pulse with some energy, and when when that pulse reaches an object, there is a reflection, and that reflection is maybe is less energy comes less energy. And depending on the object, maybe it reflects more energy or less, and maybe this is, the light intensity is a, is a good information to understand what, what, are, what that point belongs to, what type, what type of objects uh, the point belongs to. So in this case, blue means lower intensity, and you can see the noise with very low intensity, and the ground and the, the canopies of the trees with red points and, and means a very uh, intensity reflection. Another thing that we receive from LiDAR is um, when we send a pulse, we receive a feedback or more than one feedback because maybe there is some, uh, in this, for instance, um, when we send a pulse, they can reflect from one leaf or one branch of the tree, but this, as the sunlight can through the, the, canopies, the canopies of the trees, also the pulse uh, um, goes through the, those and receives different feedbacks. And so we get different feedbacks, different vocalizations, and maybe knowing that there are different, different number of returns, maybe this is important to understand what the point belongs to. And in, the, in this case, blue means less returns, so in the ground, 
there is a whole fraction and, uh, and not more. And the green means uh, more returns. Okay. So the noise, you can see the green, and some vegetation is also green. Means that there is several returns from that specific pose. So these are the direct features that we got from the LiDAR, raw data. And then we try to, to, to get more features. So the first one is the high of the points. We have the X high and Z and, um, and the Z. And the Z doesn't mean the high of the point. And we need to, to, to get this high for the model. So how you get this? So we can detect or discover what are the ground points. And from the ground points, we can build up a digital terrain model. And after then, there is a, di a difference between the, these two those models and get the high. So it's something like this. So we get the raw data up there, the digital terrain model, and then the difference between the, uh, those are the, the height of the, of the points. And maybe the, they are important. You know, we know that the power lines are over some, some high, so it's important also these features. Another thing that is important and maybe it's more the, the most important, is uh, usually the point itself doesn't mean, doesn't have uh, information enough to understand what's going around. So maybe the neighbor uh, points are very important to understand uh, what, what are the, the points. So what we do is, well, we compute the neighbor points using these, these only uh, using a 3D tree to search faster the points that belongs to, the, to that neighbor. Then we, we also calculate some features around the point, the density, so the number of the points that these are around the sphere of 60 centimeters, so it means the density, the distance between them, and the intensity, the, the average of intensity of those points. And then another thing that we calculate, the roughness, so we can see that if it is vegetation, the roughness are bigger. If it is a sharp, smooth surface, the, the roughness is lower. And maybe this is important information to, to split uh, the points. So how we do this is using the principal component analysis that gives uh, several dimensions. And we get the most two important. And with those two dimensions, two vectors, we build up a surface, and then we calculate the distance between the points of that sphere, calculate the distance between the point and that principal plane. And so the distances are bigger, the roughness is also bigger. So the differences, if the differences are lower, the, the lower the roughness. So maybe if there is a, a house with a, a sharp surface, the roughness is, is, is less is lower. Then we use random forest to identify trees. And we can see the most important uh, features. So the roughness, some features about the neighbor uh, are the most important ones. And then we get the model done. Um, so what we get in the, in the final is something like this. So with different colors. Uh, corresponding to the ground, to the power lines, to the vegetation, and now we can calculate the distance between the vegetation and, and, the, and the power lines all over the, the power line. And the process, uh, just is, it, this is just the first step. So after the LiDAR flights, we compute the distance, we put that information in the Postgres database using PostGIS, and then we have a model to forecast how the, uh, that tree will grow. Because the, the, the LiDAR flights is, is, is not every year, but is, is every three to five years. So we have to get, we have to, um, to have a model to, to understand when we would be the cut and the prune of the, of the tree, receive that feedback, tries to understand if the, if the, what is the species of that, 
of that tree, how it grows, what are the environment the conditions of, for that tree, if it's good or not for the, the growing. And so this vegetation growth model does, does this. So those are the, the projects that we have done in the EDDP. And, uh, uh, and, the, and the business already understand that it's very important, important data science and AI is very important for the business to be comp competitive and to, be, and to uh, go one walk ahead. And from my experience, and this is my final thought, from my experience, what I think is even though the data science and AI is overwhelmed by the, the high expectations and uh, interesting by the business, the truth is that what moves data scientists is the, um, is the interest to be the first to find out the, the insights of from the data, to, uh, to understand what, what, he, what are the partners, to master what are the answers, the data-driven answers, and of course to understand what is, what, uh, understand how works the world. All right, thank you. Thanks, Marco. There was um, some super interesting projects. Thanks for sharing. Um, we have time for two or three questions, if anyone has a question for Marco. Um, just a simple question. The, vegetarian, the vegetation monitoring, um, it's a quite complex model. When uh, the teams do the, the cutting and the pruning, do they uh, get some feedback to, to, to mm -hmm. improve the model? Because the people that do the cutting are typically very operational people, you know, guys that are paid really low wages just to go to do the pruning. How, what, what type of feedback do they gather for you and what type of quality is that information so you can actually improve or the vegetation uh, uh, growth module or the module in terms of the leader technology? Mm -hmm. Good question. So we received two um, points. So we received two informations. We received the distance that after the cut, so we feedback the, the systems what are the distance, the, the final distance after the cut and also is, if it is the species is correct or not. So we, we send, we believe that this species is, is a, a pine tree, and if it is not a pine tree, we receive that, that feedback from the operations, operators. And of course that information is used in the model and. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you do have any uh, that you think of, I'm sure Marco will be happy to answer them after the talk. Uh, but for now, please give a, another round of applause for Marco. Thanks very much. Thank you.